we have um, a fantastic um, setting for this afternoon. Um, in terms of our speakers, we have four speakers. We have, it's great to see all of you again. We were over the summer, we had um, about six programs that shared the experience of women in migrations. Um, we told our personal stories, we told a global stories about the experience of, from politics to um, crisis, to eating ways and, and work. So I'm, I'm really happy to share this moment and happy that our presenters are here. And I'm going to move forward into inviting Ellen Toscano, who is my collaborator in this project, to introduce all of the speakers. And at the end of this um, session, we will have Joan Morgan, who is director of the Center for Black Visual Culture, will um, be involved with the questions and answers. And if you have any questions, um, please begin to write them in the Q&A uh, prompt. And I'd like to invite Ellen, thank you. Um, thank you, Deb. And thank you to um, our public and to our panelists for joining us today. This is our seventh, as Deb mentioned, of our virtual convenings of the Women in Migrations Working Group. Uh, for those of you who are new to these talks, this is a global, ever-growing interdisciplinary network of women, or primarily women, um, artists, writers, scholars, and policymakers. Uh, we began um, these, this series in Florence, Italy in, the Ju in June of 2017. A book resulted from that convening entitled Women in Migrations, Responses in Art and History. And we're putting a citation of that book in the chat for your um, reference. We convened again in Abu Dhabi and hoped to be in person in DC and Athens this spring and summer, but for obvious reasons, um, we shifted to the virtual format. We started in Florence to share and discuss work responding to the migrant crisis, the migrant crossing from Africa to Europe through Italy and to think about that humanitarian crisis in the context of other contemporary and historic movements of people. Uh, now, in addition to um, the global, what we might say, policy crisis of migration, um, of which the horrific policies of the United States are, part, are a significant part, we're in the midst of a global pandemic, escalating tension about police violence and impunity, a hyperpartisan, highly polarized and polarizing election, presidential election, um, and this nation's failure to fundamentally address um, anti-Black racism in the country. Racism and xenophobia are pernicious partners, and that last point was made so powerfully last night in an inspiring interview between Opal Tometi with Deb and and Pamela Newkirk, and Opal spoke about how her Black Lives Matter activism arose out of her founding and leading the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. She talked about growing up in Arizona, the kind of ground zero for xenophobic immigration policy and her parents' fight to stay in the country. And it was a powerful discussion about her um, her life and her motivations, but also in her words about how the Black struggle in the United States is so interlocked with the issue of immigration, something that we, well, I'm sure all think about today. So as we begin, we'd like um, to offer our heartfelt thanks to our partners and supporters. First, the Office of Global inclusion, diversity, and strategic innovation, and its truly inspiring leader, uh, Vice President uh, Lisa Coleman, the Ford Foundation, and the NYU Bradamus Center. Um, some logistical notes, which uh, Deb uh, already mentioned um, in part, we will leave time at the end of the presentations, hopefully the last 20 minutes for questions, and we invite you to submit your questions to the Q&A section, not the chat. And if you have questions for particular panelists, please 
indicate which you um, for for which person your question is directed. Um, so I guess I will introduce uh, each of the panelists um, as they uh, begin their presentations. We're going to start today with Jennifer Bioric. She is a scholar and curator working at the intersection of literature, art, and media with a focus on French and Francophone worlds and the geographic focus on contemporary Africa. Her latest book, Unfixed Photography and Decolonial Imagination in West Africa, published by Duke University Press this year, 2020, uh, is on photography and its histories in Senegal and Benin and it represents over a dozen years of collaboration with artists, curators, and museum and heritage professionals in West Africa. Her new research looks at the representation of migrants and migration in contemporary Europe. She's currently an Associate Professor of Comparative Literature and Visual Studies and Dean of Humanities and Arts at Hampshire College. Jennifer. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Deb and Ellen and Cheryl, I guess is not here, but for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here and to share this work. And I, I just wanted to make an explicit statement that I'm always really happy to talk about my research in the company of practitioners. This is something that's really important to me. And so I really value that aspect of this space. So I'm going to share some images with you drawn from my research published in the recent book on the history of photography in Francophone West Africa. And I'm going to make a few observations about the relationship between photography, mobility, and migration in the West African context. And I have singled out images and observations that illuminate the particular ways in which women have taken advantage of these relationships between the image and image circulation and physical, geographic, and social mobility. So I'll be talking about historic materials, and I, I won't have time to put them in touch with my new research, um, but it means very much to me, again, to be here in this context today where contemporary practice is engaged. So let me try to follow the instructions. Um, of course, it didn't work exactly like it was supposed to, but let's see. Um, I'm supposed to play from the start, correct? Um, but it's still taking up the whole window, so I somehow didn't do what I was supposed to do. Forgive me. We had very good training. Um, Go back to share screen. Yeah. But my PowerPoint is not coming up in the choices, right? Can I just run it this way and ask you to interrupt me if I go over time? But can you share the screen first so we can see? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just can't see the chat, the chat window. Okay. I, I will just say Thank two you. minutes left. Okay. Thank you. Um, but I'm now also, okay, there we go. Now I've advanced. Thank you. Forgive the technical complexity. So running like a red thread through all of my research on photography and photographic collections in West Africa is a series of striking connections between the movement of photographs and the movement of people. These connections hold across diverse notions and experiences of mobility, physical, geographic, and social. In West Africa, photography ties transatlantic and trans-Saharan migrations to colonial experiences of urbanization and post-colonial ideas about freedom of movement. It ties descendants of slavers in coastal West African cities to descendants of enslaved people in both Africa and the Americas. It ties steamships to passenger jets, horses to Vespas, women living in Dakar to women living in Conakry, or women living in Dakar to men from West Africa who were stationed in Indochina while serving in the French colonial army in the 1950s. While women's own physical capacity for mobility and their ability therefore to move across geographic or political borders has historically been more limited than men's in West Africa as in most of the world, 
The photographic record clearly suggests that women did not fail to grasp or to take advantage of photography to influence their own capacity for mobility on multiple levels. In my research, conducted with local photographers, sorry, this is a Seydou Keita photograph, so some of you will recognize this photograph. Um, it's not from my research, but it's an important intertext. In my research, conducted with local photographers in mid 20th century collections in four cities, in San Luis and Dakar and Senegal and Porto Novo and Cotonou and Benin, I have found that women often use photography to comment on their mobility or more rarely but significantly, they also use photography to initiate particular voyages or to expand their actual spheres of physical, geographic, or social mobility. While photographers were across the region with very few exceptions until around the early 90s, almost always men, when it comes to the practices of photographic subjects throughout the history of photography in West Africa, women seem in many cases to have dominated. In coastal port cities, men as photographers established the commercial photographer's studio as a vital node in global communication and trade networks and as a distinctly cosmopolitan space. But it was women who most often laid claim to this cosmopolitanism in front of the camera. And um, I had thought of showing you some photos, but I'll just talk through um, this particular point around photographers' studios and communication and transportation networks. Um, this is a long-standing um, theme in the literature. So Julie Crooks writing about the history of photography in Freetown in Sierra Leone um, emphasizes photographers' efforts to locate their studios near the docks. Those were considered to be the prime studio locations. Erin um, Haney writing about the history of photography in Gold Coast in present day Ghana has emphasized the importance of steamship travel up and down the West African coast for commercial photographers. So photographers, local African born photographers working in cities like Elmina, Cape Coast and Accra would travel via steamship to cities like Bathurst, present day Banjul or Monrovia where they would set up seasonal photography student studios. So these links between different forms of transportation and even transportation infrastructures and studio infrastructures are really profound. In San Luis in Senegal, where this photograph was taken, we don't know by whom. Um, the first photographer who operated in commercial studio of which we have a documented record was actually an African-American photographer, Augustus Washington. And some of you will know his work. Um, Washington was born in Trenton, New Jersey. He was the son of a freed slave. His father was of African heritage and his mother has been described as having been an immigrant from Indochina. Um, he emigrated from Hartford, Connecticut um, to Monrovia, Liberia in 1953. Um, and from there, he worked in itinerant practice, again, traveling up and down the coast using maritime travel um, and set up a studio in San Luis in 1860. So this photograph, again, it was not taken by, by Washington. It was taken significantly later, um, but it's from San Luis and you can see the wealth of photographic history in that city. So while men, that is male photographers, establish photography as a popular practice in urban West Africa by embedding it in these trade and transportation and communication networks, it was actually women who as patrons or clients in the studio evidenced the wealth and power associated with these networks, mobilized them visually and quite literally embodied them by evidencing or performing their social, political and cultural significance in the photographic portrait. So this photograph to me demonstrates this kind of performance beautifully. In discussions of this photo with local interlocutors in San Luis, including the photographer in whose collection I saw it, he was not the photographer who took it, he kind of inherited another photographer's archive. Um, he placed great emphasis on expressions of opulence, luxury, and wealth through a kind of decoding of significant imported goods. So the notion that this was a silk pillow on the chair or a pillow that would have been embroidered with silk thread was frequently repeated. The Japanese bamboo paintings that you see on the wall below the photographs and the, the, plain, the level kind of below the photographs, you see two 
um, paintings on bamboo, um, the French needlepoint sampler, which you see off to the left, the last word fraternité. Um, and then the photographs themselves were often um, um, evinced as evidence of wealth, connection to global trade networks, and um, connection to global cultures, um, of course, largely mediated through the colonial project. These emblems of abundance and wealth encoded by the presence of imported luxury goods linking Senegal to global trading networks were associated implicitly or explicitly in conversations about this photograph with local interlocutors with the city's history as a colonial capital and as a trading port, including, of course, its history as a port in the transatlantic slave trade. Two minutes. Oh, I'm going to go faster. So these are other photographs from San Luis. And I just, I could, they could be read in similar ways. Discussions of the kinds of textiles and jewelry and forms of wealth, evidence in the photograph, um, were often explicitly gendered in conversations about the photographs and associated with female um, or feminine wealth and power. So in the late colonial period, and this is where I'll try to go much more quickly, um, we actually see a different development where women begin to use photographs to actually, I'm gonna zip here, to um, improve their social standing. And so we see evidence of practices of marriage by photo. Um, and this photograph, although I don't know if it was used to um, uh, transact a marriage by photo, was, um, was in the collection of the photographer who told me about this practice. So women in French colonial territories in West Africa in the 50s would send their photographs to soldiers from West Africa who were stationed overseas to transact marriages. These would lead to physical relocation and often um, explicitly upward social mobility um, because of colonial marriage policies. So women put their images into circulation um, in order to increase um, their own chances of making, um, say, a better match, um, and a match undertaken outside the kind of authority of the family, and so on. We also see um, women tapping into a burgeoning print culture, um, and this will be the last visual example I give you before I conclude. Um, this magazine, Bingo, was an, uh, uh, an illustrated magazine published out of Dakar starting in the 1950s. And women participated in um, Bingo's culture, print culture, um, by submitting their own photographs to be published. So women often had their photographs published on the cover of the magazine. And the magazine had a policy of sourcing its content through reader-submitted photographs. So women participated extremely actively um, in this kind of heightened circulation of um, photographs that we saw in Bingo. Um, I guess I'll say in conclusion, this is not something I've explored in my research, but it's something I'd be eager to. Um, when women left West Africa in the late 1980s and 1990s to emigrate either to Europe or now increasingly in the 21st century to the US, they most often brought the family photographs with them. So every time I turned up at a home in Senegal or in Benin to find that the photographs were not there because they had migrated, it was almost always a woman who had taken them. Um, and I find this extremely interesting. Um, the aunt who's taken the photographs to Bordeaux, the sister who's taken the photographs to Atlanta. Um, my, my sample size is not scientific, um, but I take this as another affirmation and an affirmation of the medium's ongoing significance for women in the region, even as they have emigrated and forged new to ties to and within the larger diaspora. So I'll leave it there. Thank um, you. Hopefully we can talk. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Ellen? Ellen, your mic. See, I'm trying to be a good soldier and remember to turn my mic off, but it, I never remember to turn it back on. But anyway, thank you, Jennifer. That was really fascinating. Now we're going to turn to Bridget Cooks, who is uh, an associate professor 
in the Department of Art History in the Department of African American Studies at the University of California, Irvine. Oops, now I've lost my screen. Okay. Her research focuses on um, African American artists, Black visual culture, and museum criticism. Cooks has worked in museum education and has curated several exhibitions, including Grafton Taylor Brown, Tyler Brown, Exploring California in 2018, uh, Ernie Barnes, a retrospective at the California African American Museum in 2019, and the forthcoming exhibition, The Black Index. She's the author of the book, Exhibiting Blackness, African Americans in the American Art Museum, uh, University of Massachusetts Press, 2011. Um, and I'll leave it there. Bridget? Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Deborah Willis and Ellen Toscano and all the organizers of the Women of Migration series for allowing me to participate all the way from, um, from the West Coast. And thank you for everybody who's, um, to use a dated term, tuning in, I guess I should say logging on to be a part of this now. So I am going to share with you some research uh, that I've done alongside Dr. Kelly Jones about a wonderful spirit, a wonderful woman named um, Ruth Waddy. And I'm showing you a photograph of her that I think really shows how delightful um, and wry um, uh, a woman she was. Um, she, someone who was based for most of her life in Los Angeles. Um, she was an artist primarily through uh, a printmaking. Um, she was an author. She was a collaborator in different forms an art collector, um, a motivator, a and a laborer. And I'll talk a little bit about those things. And really an organizer of, of the Black artist scene in Los Angeles starting in the 1960s um, through her death in um, 2003. And um, I'm showing you here a self-portrait uh, by Ruth Waddy of herself, a lino cut, uh, which was the, the printmaking form that she preferred um, the most. And then a photograph on the right of her with Agnes Davis in front of Rockman Gallery. Rockman Gallery is a gallery that was started by Dale and Alonzo Davis, both artists, um, gallerists, educators. Um, and this is um, in Lamert Park, uh, a, a black middle class neighborhood in Los Angeles that's still um, uh, where important things happen for Black artistic culture um, in the city. And so Ruth Waddy, um, I think what's really wonderful about her is that she had so many talents. Um, she wasn't restricted um, in terms of picking one single discipline or one field or one area of her skill set to really focus on. Um, everyone knew Ruth Waddy, um, who was interested in what Black artists were doing in Los Angeles. Black artists all knew Ruth Waddy. She was someone who was part of a kind of spirit of um, vitality, uh, a source of encouragement. She was really interested in seeing Black people create um, in different ways, and she wanted to be around that. She wanted to help to organize that. She was born in 1909 in Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, she was raised there and in Minneapolis. Um, she um, had a wonderful childhood, very encouraging parents. And she knew from a young age that she was both um, intelligent, that she was intellectual, but that she was physically strong. And I think about, and um, there's an oral history where she talks about over and over again, her body. Um, she was a petite woman but she was stronger than many of the, the young men her age. And I think it gave her a real sense of confidence to move forward in the world and to do things, whether she had a, a role model um, or not for doing them. Um, she went to college for one year uh, at the University of Minneapolis and she quit after her father died to work to support her mother and her two younger sisters. Um, 
she worked as a laborer and she, doing manual work, um, including as a maid. And um, she moved in the 1930s to Chicago for more opportunities um, for work and also just to develop herself as a young woman. She became employed by the Federal Writers Project and she met a number of influential artists and writers, Ralph Ellison, Margaret Burroughs, Elizabeth Catlett, Carter G. Woodson, um, and they really helped to set the direction of her life in the art world. I think most influential um, in terms of her relationships in Chicago was with a woman named Evangeline J. Montgomery, better known as E.J. Montgomery, an, an amazing artist, curator, gallerist, um, and really activist in her own right regarding Black artists. Um, in 1942, Wadi migrated to Los Angeles where she worked at Douglas Aircraft Corporation. That's the same time that my family migrated from Oklahoma um, to work for the defense industry and support the war effort in World War II. She spoke very fondly of being Rosie the Riveter um, and she had this job at Douglas Aircraft while she was a live-in maid. And then she also had a job as an admissions worker um, at LA County Hospital. And um, fortunately there, she met the great artist, Noah Purifoy, um, who some of you may know, um, who's revered as a junk artist. He was the first director of the Watts Towers Art Center. And there's uh, an outdoor museum of his artwork in uh, the Joshua Tree Desert um, in Southern California. By chance, someone who she worked with at the hospital was a ceramicist and she started to take ceramic classes. That was her first uh, art form. And then um, through that um, ability and her decision to, to make art and work with this particular artist, um, she got to know more black artists in Los Angeles. And, and became part of the scene, but also again, um, someone who helped to organize the scene in 1962, she had the idea that the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, known as LACMA, should have an exhibition of art by Black artists. And uh, LACMA passed on the idea, um, and they didn't have any art by Black artists on view in an exhibition until the 1970s. But this didn't deter Ruth from doing her work. She continued to focus on what she could do um, mostly as an organizer to get Black artists to be visible and to have a presence um, in the art world. She focused, uh, starting in the 1960s, on her career um, in publications as well as organizing. So two things, and I know that time is going by quickly. In 1962, she formed an organization called Art West Associated, um, they went on to have several exhibitions around Los Angeles through the 1980s. And this was a group of, uh, of primarily black artists. Uh, it was a, a way for them to work as a unit, to have a presence, um, to be able to apply for grants. And Wadi successfully received a number of grants from the NEA um, for different exhibition projects that she had. Um, she was approached by a man named Theodore Roloff Tanner um, in 1965. He was a printmaker at USC and he was white. Uh, he was very interested in what black printmakers were doing um, and wanted to work with someone who was black to try to put together um, a catalog of work. And so he approached Ruth Wadi and she was excited to be a part of this idea. Um, eventually this uh, project became Prints by American Negro Artists and it was published in 1965. And Remember. I just want to mention um, the idea of migration here um, because Ruth took a bus, she took mini buses across the country. She went to 48 different states to meet and find uh, Black artists and she said, you know, I'm working on this book um, if you give me a place to stay for a night and one meal, you can be in the book. And so it's this interesting kind of, um, in a way, reverse migration from the West going to the middle of the country, going East, going South, coming back, and then helping to produce um, this volume. Um, I'll show you 
her next uh, major project. These are the three volumes of Black Artists um, on Art. And this was the collaboration that she did with the great Samela Lewis, educator, scholar, artist, um, institution builder, um, based here in Los Angeles. Um, these books became the Bibles, the textbooks for um, African American artists who were interested in their history um, in the field of art, but also um, in finding out who their opposite number were opposite numbers were in different states. And I'll end just by showing you um, some of her own artwork. Um, in the 1970s, we really start to see the work that she's mostly well known for as an artist and these were exhibited recently in an exhibition that happened at Art and Practice in Los Angeles um, through an exhibition focusing on work in the Eileen Harris Norton collection. So Days of the Week sampler from 1973, um, focusing on um, young black girls, beauty of black children. Um, the Children set of six from 1973. Three sisters, uh, her and her two sisters, I'm sure, inspired this. This lovely print um, that really is the takeoff for a short story, right? Emergency call from 1982. What is going on? Who is this young woman? Who is she calling? What's the situation? And you see her, um, uh, that she's elevated herself on this, um, on this upside down trash can. And the last uh, one I'll show is called The Exhorters from 1976. And this, for her, she talks about this piece as expressing all of the different um, ideologies and philosophies for Black empowerment in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and you can see some people are um, skeptical. <laughs> Other people are totally committed. Um, people are, are filled, filled with uh, inspiration and spirit. Um, but there was a lot of different ideas about which direction, um, which beliefs to follow um, in order to move forward. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Bridget. And I, sorry, I've neglected to mention, I apologize, that you are currently completing your next book, um, Norman Rockwell, The Civil Rights Paintings. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Something to look forward to. Um, next, we will have Michelle Pearson Clark. Uh, she is a Trinidad born artist, writer, educator who works in photography, film, video, and installation. Using archival, performative, and process oriented strategies, her work explores the personal and political possibilities afforded by considering experiences of emotions relating to longing and loss. Her work has in, been included in numerous exhibitions from Le Musée des Beaux-Arts in Montreal to the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, um, many, many, many others. She is currently the inaugural 2021 Artist in Residence at the University of Toronto's Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies and the Photo Laureate for the City of Toronto. 19, uh, 2019 to 2022. Michelle. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Dr. Willis. Thank you to Alan Toscano and Cheryl Finley for inviting me to be to join you today and share a little bit about my work. Um, I'm speaking to you from uh, Toronto. And I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, this artwork, Sakti's Compositions, after Rashad Newsom, um, which was included in the exhibition Migrations and Meanings in Art uh, uh, earlier this year, which is part of this interdisciplinary women and migrations uh, project. So you can just see it installed there on the right. Um, uh, and just before I touch on that, just for some context, um, in general, my art practice is concerned with Black and Black queer longing and loss. I would say that uh, in some ways, grief is at the center of my practice. I'm really interested in thinking about ways that um, we know that we are always already understood to be in mourning due to racial trauma, social exclusion, and violence. Um, but intersected with that mourning is all of our other longings and losses, which is what I explore in my practice. 
and I was really um, moved and uh, touched to see the announcement yesterday of Okwe and Zuno's last exhibition coming up at the new museum, um, looking at grief and grieving in Black American communities. So before I was an artist, I worked in LGBT health promotion. Um, and so my undergraduate degree in psychology, my master's degree in social work very much informs the way that I approach um, what I do. But also um, after my mother died in 2011, I had a very traumatic grief experience. So my personal experience of grief, as well as my professional experience of working with people um, in my previous career, all feeds into uh, what I do now. And I would say the strategies that I use most in my practice are very present and emblematic in this particular work. Um, I think a lot about uh, the visuality of Blackness. I think about issues of representation and how as a Black artist, I have to contend with you know, a history of photography, a history of cinema um, that is filled, as we all know, with lots of negative and distorted images. And so for me, at this stage of my practice, these are the strategies that I have found um, most compelling and most effective for me to explore and communicate issues of affect um, and issues of visuality as I work through both my moving image and my still image work. Um, so this particular artwork is, uh, all of my work I would say is autoethnographic. Um, this is a very rough outline of migration in my own personal family. Um, based on family stories and DNA testing, I know that my roots, my ancestors lie in Guinea-Bissau on the west coast of Africa, also in India. We look at, uh, in my own sort of immediate family, migration of my parents from Antigua and Barbados to England, where they met, migration back to the region, um, migration of my, you know, grandfather, one grandfather from Dominica to Antigua, another grandfather from Barbados to Trinidad. And then for me personally, this most recent migration of um, me, my sister, and my mother from Trinidad and Tobago to Canada. And uh, how to put this, like many, like many Black people who move from a Black majority country to North America, you have to contend with Blackness in a way that is new to you. You have to come to understand um, the, the ways that Black identity Black experiences are manifested. Um, you, you confront anti-Black racism in different forms. Um, and all of this is a process that I would say is very much um, uh, feeds into this particular artwork. Um, it's from the title, you can see that it's in direct conversation, both homage and dialogue with shade composition by Rashad Newsom. And that comes from my experience of coming to Canada and coming over years to understand both the ways that Blackness in Canada is forever an absented presence. Catherine McKettrick and Ronaldo Walcott are two scholars in particular who theorized at length about the way that Blackness in Canada is always forever treated as something new, something that just seems to have arrived. Um, and related to that is uh, the Canadian myth that anti-Black racism either A, doesn't exist in Canada, or B, is defined in relationship to the United States. So we are told, well, it's not as bad as down there. You're better off. Um, and so the work is in dialogue with Rashad's to reflect all of that and very much um, informed by the visual representation that he uses in the screen test where he auditions participants for the choirs that he brings together in his live performances. So the theme for this week is joy. And I have to say, producing this work, which involved recruiting 17 Black Torontonians who all make this sound in one way or another, collectively over two days, the amount of conversations, the amount of stories, uh, the amount of uh, joy that was shared as people contemplated what it means to have this gesture that they make every day all the time be included in an artwork, be included in an artwork of this scale and of this size and being collectively to put something into a Canadian gallery to say, you know, we repress our anger to, pr to protect ourselves. What does it mean to make our frustration, our irritation, um, our disgust um, on this, you know, public in this, in this way? So I'm just going to play. Um, it's hard to understand this work without uh, hearing it. So I'm just going to play just the first 
it's are you still this in my work so it starts with us sort of setting up getting ready to film for the first minute and a half um and then as we move from the title So it continues from there, it's about 10 minutes long. The pacing, the rhythm builds to a sort of arc. And then again, it ends with stillness with each participant just looking directly into the camera um, and confronting the viewer in that way. Um, this is a picture of the initial installation at the Royal Ontario Museum. And uh, again, thinking about the theme of this week, this was a very overwhelming experience for me as an artist. The Royal Ontario Museum is a traditional museum and to have a contemporary art show in there meant that the vast majority of this audience came to see the dinosaurs or came to see the Greek statues and would stumble across this show. And as you can imagine, with that projected sound into the gallery, as soon as you walked into that show, this piece was present in a way. And so to watch a, not, a largely non-contemporary art audience um, view and, and confront and be annoyed and irritated by this work. Um, but also the Royal Ontario Museum, this exhibition was part of a five year, almost reparations process between the Royal Ontario Museum and the black community in Toronto. Um, and I can talk more in the, in the Q and A about uh, why that was. So the amount of joy, there were some black people who stepped into the realm in 2018 for the first time in 30 years. So there was a lot of joy around this exhibition itself. Um, and so for the artwork to be presented in this context uh, was, was really meaningful to me. So I'll stop there for now. Um, thanks. Thank you. And you had one minute left. <laughs> Thank you. We'll better get back to you at the end. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and now we'd love to hear from Ana Teresa Fernandez. She is a Mexican performance artist and painter. Fernandez's work explores the politics of intersectionality and the ways it shapes personal identity, culture, and social rhetoric. Fernandez resists borders. She actively crosses borders by creating work that challenge the complexities of migration. Her work is performance-based and shows the importance of the plight of migrants encountering border walls. Anna. Thank you so much. Um, Nikki, can I? So I actually, I'm gonna start by talking about what I've been recently doing during the pandemic. Um, I'm pretty much been a performance artist for the last 20 years and my work deals with visibility and invisibility, erasure and exposure and through performance using the body at the center of the work and especially at borders. Um, one of the images that you see on the right hand side where I'm erasing the border at the Tijuana San Diego fence, uh, which is a fence that actually runs through the border and penetrates into the ocean to divide the US and Mexico is one of the pieces that I did in 2011 um, with the first separations of families under the Obama administration. Um, 
which is an image I've worked with a lot with Dev Willis, but, and as well as one of the, the images you see at the bottom right, uh, which is a painting that I did at the Mediterranean Sea. But what I really wanna talk about today, and I know that we have 10 minutes, um, is a project that I've been working on now during the pandemic because of the forest uh, being sheltering in place and understanding that borders actually have stopped um, quite, frank quite frankly and understanding not only the invisibility of people at borders, but the invisibility of people, of migrants that are here in the United States. And that came pretty clear to me um, during this project that I um, very proudly we presented to the Ford Foundation recently that I work with early in Correa Valencia. And I just wanna talk a little bit about the story of how we actually met. So next slide, please. Arlene and I met at the Aspen, in Aspen actually, just so strange. Um, I was there to teach at the Anderson Ranch, uh, which is a really hoity-toity um, artist residency where it's mostly white. However, there was this artist that was there on scholarships. She's an undocumented uh, artist from the Napa Valley area. And she was working and so we completely gravitated towards each other. And she was working primarily with images of her community, uh, which are grape pickers from the Napa Valley area, and only using colors that she would make from the soil from the, around that area. And her and I began this huge discussion about like actually using color to, to create the, the visibility of these workers because it's mostly you know these high vis, neon orange and yellow. And she hated me for it, but she began using them. And we stayed friends over the, over the years. And um, for the last two years, I actually have been, I was never her teacher, but I continued to stay in touch with her while she assisted CCA. And she posted on her Instagram one day how people tend to always speak for her and how she hated it because she says, we are not voiceless. We do not need you to speak for us. We have a voice. We can speak for ourselves as an undocumented migrant. And so that prompted me as an artist, I, I really kind of sat with this information, being from Mexico, being someone that came here when I was 11 years old and having the possibility to go back and forth, to speak freely um, in the privilege that I had and offering this platform. So she instigated this idea um, where I came up with, these, with this project where I began sewing or threading voices of women onto these sweatshirts or sweaters. And when I asked, what she would want to have on her sweatshirt, she said, we're not invisible. And not only that, but she brought this high vis hoodie with her. And so as, she, as I was threading it in my house, I started thinking about the materiality itself. And I went on Amazon and I bought all this high vis uh, material. And together, next slide, please. We came up with, um, with this hoodie that says we're not invisible and in Spanish as well with Somos Visible. This was uh, a month prior to the pandemic. So this was around February with, when we came up with this hoodie just by, by having conversations, her and I. Um, and then the pandemic hit and we were, I was contacted by Art in Action to do a campaign for the census to target Latinx communities, especially people that only either spoke Spanish um, or were um, actually illiterate or disabled as well. And so I said, why don't we bring this hoodie into, why don't we turn this hoodie into the campaign uh, by actually creating these hoodies and really um, inciting people to sign up for the, for the census. And as a, you know, kind of like as, a, as an appreciation, we gift them these hoodies to be, so they can be seen. Um, little did we know that the pandemic was going to hit and, you know, all this was supposed to happen like at, at the uh, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. And so we decided to start mailing them. So we started mailing them all across the U.S. But one of the things that we noticed that it was primarily, you know, there were people of color, but there were a lot of individuals that were still mostly white that were kind of um, interacting with us. And that's next slide, please. That's when we said, you know what, we actually have to go into the communities. Because one of the things that we realized during the pandemic is that we're not seen not only as individuals, but in the healthcare system as with voting rights. And not only that, we're not being counted. And so 
we really uh, started doing these pop up uh, where Arlene and I went. Next slide, please. We went, uh, sorry, next one as well. We went into different communities, such as the Bay Shore, um, where my studio is, in the Bayview in the shipyard, where it's a primarily African American community. The individuals that were first forced to locate there uh, were individuals that were creating the ships for World War II. And so this is a community that I know through the census program has not been well counted. It's incredibly undercounted. So her and I went out there with uh, just our phones, a uh, hundred of these hoodies that we had made and we began counting individuals. Next slide, please. Not only that, but we went to different areas in Napa, in the market. And one of the things we also did was go out actually into the fields at night. We're great pickers. Um, and especially women, we had these very long conversations about the fears and the resistance that they had about being counted. Because as individuals that have been moving, they think that they don't have a place, they don't have a voice. And so it became, um, and we have this beautiful image of, at night uh, in Napa where there's all these workers and they're wearing their hoodies. And it's the color about it's the color that represents the essential workers. And it's one of the things that I've been really incredibly aware of how language gets used, you know, before it's predominantly wetback, mojado, these, you know, the trash picker. And now all of a sudden through the pandemic, we've kind of seen a lifting of these individuals, which are mostly migrants being taken into account and being talked and referred to as essential. And so these colors, telling individuals that we are essential, we need to be seen, we need to be heard. Um, next slide, please. And this is one of the images as well that I've been working on during this time in COVID. Um, I did a performance at the border uh, in November, back in November when the separation, the, uh, the detention camps and the separation, uh, families were being separated at these detention camps. And the images that we kept seeing over and over again was of these children wrapped in these space blankets. And I, I'm constantly aware of both uh, language that gets used and the visuals. And to know that these actually, these space blankets were invented in 1964 by NASA as a way to keep their astronauts warm. Um, and, you know, they're incredibly thin, they're very resourceful, they're easy to, to, to travel with. Um, and for me, there's this notion of exploration and movement in outer space, right? And all of a sudden, these space blankets are being used for illegal aliens. So different type of outer space creature that is unwanted, not only that, but is now being detained in cages. So in November, I did this performance where I set out um, these laundry lines and hung over 100 of these space blankets. And not only that, but I have this image with my husband where him and I attempted to kiss through the space blanket, which abs does not allow any oxygen. Uh, there's no permeability. So your, your breath does not exit, nor does it come in. And so you're completely contained in this space. And based on the lovers of Magritte, we recreated this, this, uh, this piece by using the space blankets. And I have to say that one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about recently is how we take in information about the world. And I, I often think about, especially now being separated and so many individuals being um, isolated and separated. When we give a hug, I find that most often people close their eyes to receive, to feel, to empathize. And so we're able to see and connect with each other better right? Or when you taste something, you close your eyes, or where you listen to music, you're able to listen or meet that information better. However, I think that now this ability to just see things and have our eyes wide open to what's happening and not be able to meet what is happening, the erasure of communities, the Un that inability to help these communities that are being tragically uh, impacted by this pandemic. 
And not only that, but at these detention camps where women are now receiving hysterectomies, where it's the possibility to procreate, to continue that migration path forward. To me, it's just, I feel like maybe people need to close their eyes again to be able to re-empathize with the world. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop my presentation and thank you. Thank you, Anna. It's, um, you know, ending with that piece, um, so much to talk about and thank you so much in offering um, solutions as well um, with the, with the t-shirt. Um, so we will open up for questions, but I'd like to introduce Joan Morgan. Um, Joan Morgan is our um, Center for Black Visual Culture, um, our director. She's an award-winning win um, feminist author and scholar in American studies. She's a pioneering hip-hop journalist, and she's coined the term hip-hop feminism in 1999 when she published the groundbreaking book, When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost. Her book has been used in, in college courseworks and, and across the country. Um, she's also um, a, a visiting, oh, this is an old one. <laughs> she, she also taught at, at Duke and at Stanford. And um, her most, uh, she has a couple of projects that she's working on now, but most recently that we all uh, are familiar with is in 2018, um, Simon & Schuster published her book, She Begat. She Begat This, 20 Years of the Miseducation of Lauren Hill, which celebrated the 20th anniversary of the influential uh, debut album. She's won uh, numerous awards and, and we love her voice. And so welcome, Joan, to reflect. Hi, I wanted to thank everyone for those really um, thought-provoking uh, presentations and particularly these discussions around grief in this particular moment and what it means when, for all of us, our inability to move in the ways that we are very accustomed to moving um, brings us closer to these thoughts and concepts that we work through in terms of women and migration. Um, the Q&A box is starting to, to, to light up. So let me see what people would like to ask. Um, from Joanna Smith, curious if Anna has reached out to New York-based immigration rights groups her work is so nationally applicable to their efforts to hashtag GOTV, census, and uplifting undocumented workers. So Anna, that question is for you. Uh, we have had a national response to this campaign and not only through the hoodies, but we also had the, hold on the the shirts <laughs> that someone from Bisbee, um, Arizona contacted us from a nonprofit that that um, worked with primarily with artists with disabilities. Um, and so they created, they wanted to participate and they created these shirts. And so we've been distributing them and um, sending people to them because Arlene and I were hand making all of these. Um, and that my husband was like, that's it. Like no more in the kitchen. <laughs> there were like stacks and stacks and stacks. Um, but for, I mean, it's just, it was one of those things that the institution closed and we needed to extend beyond the walls. And what we like made these, like we pimped out these burros and it was just like organically, like really just going to where the communities were and physically Arlene and I putting ourselves at different locations. So I, I mean, it's been so organic that we really haven't had time to, um, you know, create more of a network. So if anyone knows or wants to connect me with any organization nonprofit, I'd be very happy to, you know, work with them. Great. Uh, we have a question from, oh, this one is to Anna and the other artists. How has the pandemic impacted how you think about spark, make, and share your art? Uh, 
Um, for me, I would say, um, because my work is already kind of about grief, you know, it hasn't changed, my preoccupations haven't changed too much in terms of the, the projects that I've been working on and the projects that I have sort of anticipated to come next. But in terms of the kind of really immediate, as things got canceled and postponed, and I, all, of, all of the new things that I've added since the pandemic all have a focus on uh, supporting other artists. Um, as opposed to focusing on my own artwork. You know, I have a lot of privilege because I get to work full time as an artist. And so for example, in this residency, um, because I'm not teaching this fall and I applied for this residency at UFT, uh, rather than make my own artwork, my proposal was that I extend my practice into curation for the first time. Um, I have this sort of unusual role as photo laureate, which is uh, something that is similar to a poet laureate. So my role is to be an advocate and an ambassador for photography and visual arts in Toronto. And so, you know, there's a lot of blurring between my personal practice and the things I do as photo laureate. And so curating a show of photography rather than making my own work was an opportunity to bring those things together. Um, I'd create a, create, create an opportunity for emerging artists um, but also, I think there's a lot that will deepen my practice by reading and learning and being in dialogue with, uh, you know, curators. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to help me as well, right, as I move forward and work with curators myself. Um, so that's just for me, I, I think the collectivity aspect to my practice, the social practice part of my practice, those things have come to the forefront. Um, as, as you know, mutual aid, we see how mutual aid has happened in all kinds of microwaves. And for me, that has come to the forefront in, in my practice as well. I'm, I'm gonna jump in and follow up with that um, question. First, I wanna thank uh, the person who posed it. There's an incredible tension right now between the push for productivity, <laughs> right? Uh, um, as uh, practitioners or scholars, or if you walk in both spaces or just one, and honestly holding space for grief. And I, I'm just curious from all of you about how you're, you're balancing, um, balancing that. Because we are in a really sad moment. Anyone? So Bridget, do you want to? Uh take that? Well, I, I'll say something which is, yeah, we are in this really sad moment. I don't have any resolution, but I will say it's a struggle. I think um, it helps to have work that allows you to express and work out some of that struggle, you know, so that if your work is about uh, death and grieving and mourning, um, there's a way in which it's, um, and I don't mean to, be, to belittle or mischaracterize the work of, of scholarship and art making, but it, that it can be therapeutic in a way that's productive and perhaps helping you as the creator of the work and ultimately people who see or, or read the work. But that's not enough. And you know, it's, it, you still have to figure out ways to take care of yourself and um yeah kind of accept that we're not going back to how things were um not everything needs to go back to how it was anyway things need to change and that we have to give ourselves a break you know to be able to understand that um anti-blackness um anti-immigration uh, um, anti-human politics <laughs> that we're dealing with right now really have an effect on our psychology and our emotional well-being. So it's a struggle. Thank you, Bridget. Just um, to let you know that Jennifer um, was in a storm and lost the internet, so she's trying to get back in. Okay. I would just add to that too, I think getting more comfortable with refusal um, I have felt a tremendous amount of empowerment um, and solidarity with the people, you know, we've always, activism has always been a part of my life. Activism has always been part of what allows our communities to survive. But the level of um, speaking up, the level of risk that I have seen Black women take this summer to speak truth to power 
it's like gone to another level. And so I have felt empowered by these individual acts, you know, across, across our sectors to, to feel more comfortable to say no, you know, and no, it's not going to happen today. It's going to happen tomorrow, you know, because as, as important, what I do, I do feel is important, but in the end it's art, right? Like it's, if the exhibition does, you know, if you don't get this thing by the deadline, if it's not published the day it was, I think like we'll all be okay, you know, so getting more comfortable with refusal and boundaries, people's entitlements to us, our time, our input, even within communities, it's hard sometimes, but just feeling more comfortable to say, you know, uh, I'm saying no more to make more space because recognizing that I have reduced capacity and there is more of a priority for me. If, if a friend calls, that has to come first. You know, if somebody's in crisis, that has to come first and the work, the work comes after for me. Thank you, Michelle. I'm, I'm going to follow your, um, Michelle, your lead, because it's, it's so true. Like Bridget said that, you know, I'm saying yes to too many things. And um, Joan has been um, pointing that out to me as well, as well as Ellen. And I need to say no, but, you know, and it's, it's too much, you know, and I'm starting following Michelle. <laughs> Thanks. And I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with, um, I think that one of the beautiful things that has, um, as an outcome from this really incredibly tragic and sad situation has been that there's been a little bit of a dismantling of the walls. And so um, seeing this, just energy pour out into the streets and kind of exercising your your body and exercising the possibilities of nature and outside and really kind of instigating more of these engagements um, to create visibility to create uh, these challenging notions of what we take for granted um, to 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 just transcend what is given to us, but to insist that we create our own, um, you know, like our, our own visibilities and how do our own truths. And um, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, using just even the great highway here in San Francisco, which is right along the beach as a, as a way to kind of like create um, art interventions. And you see it all throughout the U.S. And I think that that's I think one of the uh, therapeutic, if you will, um, for as to follow Bridget's um, terminology, but I think that kind of going into ourselves and being able to create something and put it out in the world and have it be reflected, it's there, there is so, be able to transmit love and positivity in that way. It's just incredibly, incredibly constructive. Thank you. Um, let's see. In your work and research, do you feel joy is the easing of suffering or the freedom to make meaning of suffering? Can you speak a bit about what the other side of grief, displacement, et cetera, looks like to you? And that wasn't, that wasn't to a specific panelist, so anyone can answer it. Well, I, I, I talked about grief being at the center of my practice. Um, I, think, uh, I think in terms of joy, I think both. I think moments when the suffering, when you do feel the suffering is eased can be a moment of joy. Um, making meaning definitely is a way to find joy. For me, I, I, in my own experience, I don't think there's, a, there's an other side of grief. I think that the idea that there are stages of grief and something that we move through is is an um, unfortunate concept that holds, continues to hold sway in our culture, but it's not actually how humans grieve. Um, you know, having to do formal research into grief for, for my MFA thesis, I came to understand, you know, postmodern grief theorists talk about that making meaning of suffering and learning to live with grief, making space in your life for grief is how, is how we heal, right? We, it never actually goes away. 
Um, I, you know, the metaphor I often use is I feel like it's sort of like this bubble and there's times when that bubble is very small and there's not a lot of room for anything else. And there's time when that, bu that bubble inflates and there's room for joy and there's room for play and there's room. But for me with my mom, I might hear a certain song or her birthday or mother's day and that like it shrinks back down, you know, and it's like, it's tight again and it's painful and there's not a lot of room. But the more time that goes on, the more the bubble inflates more often and the bigger that inflation gets. So there's more room for me to do other things um, as I live with my grief, but I don't feel like I will ever get to the other side of something. I think it's something that we learn to live with. Um, I was asked a question recently in an interview this week or last week, it's all blurring together now, but I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna actually ask, ask you someone, a lot of my work is, um, actually in black women and pleasure and it's a very odd time to be talking about uh pleasure but it's also very necessary and the question was how do you not feel guilt about that as women um particularly given our uh, the roles prescribed for us as nurturers, as caretakers, as friends, as daughters, as mothers, um, how do you stake the claim and the right to pleasure as, as women who are also artists? Because for me, <laughs> I don't know more joy than what I feel with Black people. <laughs> like, you know, I just feel that you know, as, as I have, as I've traveled through the world, you know, no matter where I encounter black people, there is something familiar. And to me, that familiar thing is that, that relationship to life, that relationship to each other, you know, it's like walking down the street in Johannesburg and seeing men cock up on the side of the road, just the way they are in Port of Spain, you know, and this ease with like each other and this the love for a story, the love for a joke, you know. I come from a country that pleasure is at the center of Trinidad and Tobago's like national way of being in the world. And I don't, I don't know, maybe just because I was raised in that culture, you, you, give, you give it all to the morning, like you give it all to the strife, but you give it all to the joy. So there's no guilt in feeling the joy because you, when it's time to mourn, you're fully in, you know, you're there, you're feeling the pain, you're supporting your neighbors, you know, we know those images of people jumping down into the grave, like it's, you know, we're all in. So I don't feel guilt when I feel pleasure because I know that the, the, the pain, is, the pain is, is a big part of my life, the pain of my communities, my own pain, the way that I try to support other people. And so I don't feel guilt when I feel pleasure. And certainly, personally for me, it's like, you know, when you lose somebody you love, like your mom that you're really close to, um, you know that, that they, they would want you to be happy, right? They want you to, to feel joy and to continue on. So um, I think those, as an adult, learning and enforcing and implementing boundaries into my life has been really helpful so that I feel like I give a lot to my community, but given a lot to myself and joy is part of that, that that's that's for me i'm perfectly comfortable with that yeah we have time for two more questions and jennifer has just returned unfortunately there's a storm in in her neighborhood <laughs> that's great because the next question is for her <laughs> um jennifer in your book you discuss how photos of individuals who have died have moved from one wall to another wall on the other side of the room, I feel as if we are moving our grief from one side of the room to another. Oh, actually, it's it's a comment, but would you like to comment on the comment? Wow. Um, I feel as if we're moving our grief from one side to another. I don't think I will. I think I'll leave the comment as is and thank the commenter. Also, just if you would like to just comment on the, the aspect of women who are migrating and what they decide to take with them, what they carry with them mm -hmm. in the photographs, if you can comment about that and that type of movement as, as I see this question is, 
is a comment is responding to, you know, we can move forward in different ways. Um, thank you, Deb. I, th I think that for me, and I'm, I'm really sorry I missed this key part of the conversation. I had to change buildings due to the storm. Um, I think that what I've seen in my research and what strikes me as really significant in terms of thinking about loss and these kind of gaps that emerge it's as if there are gaps in the archive when one shows up in one place and the photographs are no longer there. But in fact, it's not a gap, it's a displacement, right? And the photographs are somewhere else and the significance lives on and the relationships and the families live on. And um, I think that's what's most significant to me is the ways in which, say, the photographs continue to communicate across these spaces in the same way that the photographs of the living and the dead communicate, right, when they move from one wall to another. I mean, these separations are, um, they're necessary, but they're, they're not, um, they're necessary and they're important, but somehow, you know, they don't, they don't constitute a radical rupture, right? They're, they're, they're about, as, as much about connection and communication and relation and carrying histories and intergenerational transmission and, and um, transmission of stories and memories. So, so I think that, you know, the stories travel and they travel with the images and the affect travels and the relationships travel and they remain connected in all these spaces. I, I think that, um, yeah, I, I don't have anything definitive to say, but that's the most important, that's sort of the lesson, right? Is that things don't disappear, they don't go away, they, they get displaced and relocated and they stay in connection. I thought Michelle's map was really interesting. <laughs> Michelle's work was really interesting. The way you, you entered the work and described the work for us in relation to those family migrations and that family history, um, that for me is continuous, right? With the kinds of movements that I've become interested in my research. And one thing I didn't say in my presentation, I forgot to say the, the, the reason, I mean, there's many reasons I chose that gesture, but one of the fascinating things about that gesture is we know in the movement of our peoples, how many things had to be left behind. We know how many things have been adapted and morphed and evolved over time. So we can still see the roots, but it looks different today. Whereas that sound, is, that hasn't changed in 500 years, mm -hmm. right? That, that sound moved with us and it's, it's, it's still the same on the continent, right? And so it's uh, in terms of movement and migration that that sound in particular has a, a very deep um, meaning around those issues as well. Uh, the last question actually speaks directly to our theme this year for the Center for Black Visual Culture. And Dominica Laster would like to thank you all for a very generative discussion and she wants to know if any of the presenters would like to speak to the notion and or practice of joy as resistance or the significance of joy in your practice more broadly. I'd like to say something about Bridget's um, discussion of Ruth Wadi. I read about Ruth Wadi in the 70s. I've never, never met her, but the way you described her I just felt such joy in the way that she traveled to create an art community and an exhibition. So mm -hmm. um, I just want to comment on that part. Yeah, I would love to say just something about that. Um, uh, thinking about what Michelle said in terms of you feeling like you always feel so much joy when you're around Black people. And I, it, that's hard to explain to people, I think, who aren't Black because they don't have that experience of being, you know, there's a sense of safety and not being isolated and feeling like people understand you. Um, and of course, everyone is different and we're all individuals, and you know, but there's still something like, oh, hey, you know, like in Orange County, it's hard to be in a group of Black people, right? So when we get together to do different events, it's like this really exciting thing. I think for Ruth Wadi, I was, you know, naming all these different roles that she 
had in her life as organizer and artist. And, and I, I agree with what Deb is saying. It, there had to have been this joy in just being around Black people and helping to create opportunities for uh, further collaboration, further projects, further events, that someone had to be there to encourage and connect people to make sure that the community um, remained vital and alive and energetic. Um, she loved to see Black people doing things in some very basic ways. She was like, this is great. I don't care if you're a writer or an artist or what have you. I want to be part of what you're doing, you know, because you are, you are being generative, you are productive, um, you have value and you see the value around you. So that, that's, there's joy in that. And it is inherently an act of resistance, right? Because we are a people who are not supposed to survive. And we're told that every day. So there has to be that joy in the resistance. Um, there's joy in, in pleasure because we know that that is negating what we're supposed to be experiencing in life. You know, so in a way it's, it's very basic. I think it's also, it's spiritual, but it's social. Um, the fact that Ruth Roddy wasn't any one thing, but she was there and everyone knew her, I think speaks to a kind of pleasure of being and, um, and contributing. And I just wanted to piggyback on the, your beautiful phrase about adding value and that being the participant of joy. Um, I think that that's what we seek to be, to be seen, to be valued for who we are, what we bring. And oftentimes we're categorized into different segments that actually say, no, you know, you're not, that doesn't have value because you make X a year. And so I think that um, as artists, we have that agency to like change that knob around and create ways um, and avenues in which to kind of migrate that discussion. And through, I saw it time and time again, when we were out in the streets doing these pop-ups for the census where workers that have these like essential that use these essential uniforms um especially in napa actually they have to purchase them they're not the wineries don't provide them so they're they have to go and find them and buy them and they're expensive and for them to see them and see them in a different context and where everyone in the market's like wearing them and the kids are wearing them and they're like that's my uniform, you know, kind of eliciting that moment in which you change that conversation, you change that perception. I think that where you see that individuals that are older and kids and they're like in the oversized hoodies, but they're wearing your colors, all of a sudden it's like, you know, yeah, those are my colors. That's me, you know, and being able to create that agency to articulate that value or to insist that someone has value, I think that that is like, you know, my heart just bursts. So it's the definition of joy. Yeah, I 100% I echo that, you know, my work is experimental documentary. So I work with people all of the time. And that process of people coming forward to say, I will be in a video, I will be in a photograph, because I understand what it means for people like us to be in a white cube. I understand the importance of that image being present for an audience. The things that you are trying to say are things I want to say too. You know, it's like, I don't, that's how I work. And that same feeling that you're describing of folks being in the market, seeing people in the gallery space, see themselves, like Sakteeth is, you know, it wasn't blown up big in, in the exhibition in January, but it's a monumental size. It's overwhelming, you know, on opening night. I mean, some people were almost hysterical because it was just such an overwhelming feeling to see because contemporary art elevates, right? Contemporary art says this is worthy of cultural consideration. This is worthy of cultural conversation. And so I get a lot of joy from making. I'm a people person. I love working with folks. I get a lot of joy from the stories and the engagement and the drama and everything with the making. And then I get joy from 
seeing people see themselves, seeing people see people like themselves, there's a tremendous amount of joy in that. I feel very, very, very lucky that I get to be, you know, the agent in that process for folks. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, bringing joy and resistance and work and, you know, ways of um, creating a fashion that brings joy and understanding and a message at the same time. Um, you know, using neon as, you know, a signifier in, in, in many ways. But I, I noticed dress in um, the connection of um, the historical photographs and what it meant for a, a, a woman to be mobile in, in different places. So um, Ellen and I thank you all and let's stay in touch and, and we, we move forward. Uh, one of the questions that um, someone asked, uh, Paulette asked of what, what goes, what happens in the future. We're hoping that one day that, that we can publish these experiences and some of the works in, uh, in a, another publication, Women in Migrations too. So thank you all. Thank you, our attendees, and to NYU. Take care. Bye, y'all.